So as Mark said tonight, I'm going to be talking about Christina Broom, who was a former Streatham resident. Um, she, I don't know how long she was in Streatham and most of the career, most of her photographic career actually took place whilst after she'd moved to Fulham. But I think you can claim her and her family as one of your own um, as local Streatham. And um, she's often credited as being one of the first, if not the first, female press and commercial photographers. A remarkable achievement. Um, and as you can see, here she is standing very formidable, I always think, uh, in this image. Um, you wouldn't really want to get on the wrong side of Christina when looking like that. And hopefully I'll be bringing out a little bit about her character um, during, the, um, during the talk tonight. Um, and I have to thank um, one of your um, Streatham Society uh, colleagues, John Brown, for these images uh, that were taken of, um, well, they, what they do is depict a stationery shop that Christina Broom and her husband Albert ran at 87 Streatham Hill. And you can see just on the image on the left, you can just about see the, the name Broom. And Mark, very thankfully, sent me an images of what the shop looks like today. And amazingly, it doesn't really seem to have changed very much. Um, unfortunately, whilst the brooms were in this location in about 1903 to 1904, um, Albert suffered a very severe sporting injury, which meant he was unable to continue to assist in the business. And so rather courageously, um, Christina, as I say, a very formidable woman, she had one daughter called Winifred, and she decided um, that she was going to have to become the main breadwinner of the family and um, decided to, to become um, a, a photographer. Never having had any, any training or anything, she initially borrowed a camera and a tripod and went out into the streets of London to really take images of some of the street views, but also to capture um, the spectacle and the pageantry of Imperial London at the time. It might seem a slightly odd thing to do to suddenly decide to become a street photographer, but actually it does really show Christina's sort of uh, business, um, business head, if you like. Um, she really understood the commercial potential of picture, photo, uh, picture uh, postcards. And what she did was um, she took images and then produced them as postcards, which were then sold in the shop. And this was very enterprising of her. And of course, in the early 20th century, photograph um, any form of picture postcard or photographic postcard was incredibly popular. And of course, sending a postcard was the most effective form of communication. In many respects, um, in London in particular at this time, you could get up to seven postal deliveries every day, which seems to us incredible. So if you decided you wanted to meet someone in the afternoon in Selfridges or something, then you could send a postcard to your friend in the morning and say, meet me in the tea room at Selfridges at three o'clock. And they would receive it in time uh, by lunchtime to get ready and then go up to the West End. So she was pretty business savvy really to decide that what she was gonna do was not just take photographs, but to make them into commercial picture postcards and sell them. And of course, when Christina started to do, to do this, um, it was really at the start, at the beginnings really of um, the uh, Votes for Women campaign on the streets of London. Those of you are very familiar with the Emmeline Pankhurst of um, Women's Social and Political Union that was founded in Manchester in 1903. And in 1906, the movement moved its headquarters down to London because like any political party, obviously you really had to make a noise under the nose of government in Westminster to make your mark. But the Women's Social and Political Union were not the only um, organisation fighting for the right to vote. There was also what we refer to as the Constitution or National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. I'm sure many of you are aware of Millicent Fawcett and she was really in charge of those organisations. 
And it was about 1908 when these two organisations decided that they were going to make their presence felt on the streets of London. And one of the reasons they did that was because in 1907, um, Asquith laid down a challenge to the Votes for Women campaigners. And he said, prove to me that the majority of women want the right to vote. In 1908, in April, Asquith becomes prime minister. So the two large organizations, the Women's Social and Political Union, who we now refer to as the militant suffragettes, and the non-militant National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies said, okay, we will prove to you that women want the vote by organizing two mass demonstrations in London. And um, Christina Broom was onto this straight away. She wanted to capture this sort of um, wonderful spectacle that was happening before, um, uh, sort of um, unveil unveiling before her. And the first suffrage campaign that she captured was the June 1908 um, procession of the NUWSS. And here we have one of her images. Um, of the women standing with some of the 800 beautifully designed and embroidered banners that they carried in that procession. And as a curator of the, Muse of, of the Museum of London Suffragette Collection, something that I absolutely adore about Christina Broom's images of the suffrage campaign are this sort of unique visual representation that she create, has created um, of, of these campaigns, these public facing campaigns of the militant and the non-militant organizations. And, um, you know, this was really something that now we have as, a, as part of the visual legacy of the campaign. It's absolutely unique in terms of what she was recording and how she presented these images. And of course, I'm not a photographer, I'm a curator, but I know from a photographic viewpoint, um, they're absolutely beautiful, these images, um, the way that she has captured the, the, the sort of individuals, but also the groups. So here we have the NUWSS women, and I'm not sure if you can see in the middle of this image, there's a banner that says homemakers. And in the same, uh, same event, the NUWSS um, procession and spectacle of 1908 June, we have the banner of the Writers Suffrage League. And the most amazing thing for me is that we actually have those banners in our collection. So it's making these connections between both the visual legacy and the material legacy of the campaign, which is just such a wonderful thing, not just for me as curator, but also for researchers. Because of course with black and white images, they're very spectacular, but you can't actually see, you know, the sort of colors to, so to have the actual banners themselves as well is really wonderful. Um, something else that she really captured was um, the, the next uh, event um, in 1908, which was um, the march um, and procession and spectacle organised by the militant suffragettes, the WSPU. And um, here we have an image of um, the rally in Hyde Park. And I just love the way that she must have been standing back. She was quite a small person. So if we imagine that she could have been standing back and looking at this stage and the mass of people in front of her, you can see a lot of men wearing all sorts of weird things like top hats. I'm not quite sure what, why people were wearing top hats in Hyde Park. Obviously, a lot of these people hadn't necessarily come to see the, the women, but were drawn to the spectacle as Christina was, who uh, you know, obviously saw this as, a, as an amazing opportunity to capture these these astounding events. Um, I love this woman you can see in the middle of the um, of the stand she's got her um, graduate's gown on with her graduate's um, cap cap and gown and you know these were very very proud woman women and I think the other thing that this image really captures for me is the self-confidence of the lady giving the speech. She looks relatively young 
And this was something that the suffrage campaign really gave these, these young women, you know, this, the confidence to do this public speaking. And of course, much of this crowd would have been very hostile. Um, and, you know, this is really captured in this image here. And here we have a lovely, more posed image that Christina took of stand six. Um, and um, this, you know, one, is one of the 20 platforms where the women were, were giving talks that when it was referred to as Women's Sunday. And uh, again, you know, this sort of whole range of women, um, you can see from their faces, you know, people, these are lesser known suffragettes. These are women that we wouldn't really know about, but they really provide like a snapshot of the women who were drawn to the militant uh, suffragette campaign. Um, and all different ages from all different backgrounds. Again, there's another woman with her cap and gown looking very proud. Um, and you can see right in the center, um, there's um, a sash on, on the woman and it says banner captain. And this really sort of tells you the level of organization that went into these events. Um, everyone had their place, everyone had their role. Uh, the lady standing next to the banner captain has another silk badge, a satin badge, which would have probably said speaker. Uh, we have some of these in the collection as we have the banner captain sash. So again, it's linking this visual culture with the material culture in the collection that really makes Christina Broom's images so strong and so significant. Perhaps one of the most significant series of photographs that we have um, um, done by Christina are the images that she took of the women's exhibition that was organised by the Women's Social and Political Union in May 1909. This was a two week event. It was a recruitment event, but also a fundraising event. And the WSPU were incredibly successful at fundraising. Um, and this was one of their more spectacular fundraising events. It was held at a place called Prince's Skating Rink in Knightsbridge. And um, we're not really sure what Christina's role was in this event, but she really, um, it is quite possible that she was commissioned to take photographs of the event. Um, and then those, her, her photographs would, as I said, be made into postcards and then they would be sold. So again, this was another form of fundraising. And the Women's Social and Political Union were known to commission photographers to undertake series of um, photographs to make into postcards. And then they would be sold in the WSP shops or through their mail order. And they were a very lucrative form of income come but also very important for spreading the message because I've said as I said earlier you know um, postcards were the most effective form of communication and so they were they were seen very much as a form of propaganda by the um, women's social and political union leadership in the days leading up to the exhibition that opened in May um, Christina was um, out and about on the street capturing uh, these wonderful series of images of, um, of, of, of the suffragettes going out and actually announcing the event, publicizing it. Um, again, linking with the material culture, the, the beautiful purple, white and green um, um, silk scarf in the center that this very young suffragette is wearing. Um, she may have even been the daughter of the lady standing next to her. We have probably about seven or eight of those wonderful motoring silk scarves in the collection. So it's just so lovely to see them in action, see them being worn rather than, you know, that it actually really brings the object to life when you see it being used and worn in this way. Um, and um, they also announced the um, exhibition through horse on horseback. You can see these uh, very uh, sort of severe looking women, <laughs> suffragettes on horseback um, going around the streets. And you can imagine how this sort of attracted attention. This was all to do with just publicizing this two week exhibition that was held by the WSPU. And um, she also the WSPU Drum and Fife Band. Um, and um, they had been created because the Women's Social and Political Union realized that they were having to rely a lot on male bandsmen. 
So what they did was they created their own drum and fife band um, so that they could um, go through the streets and make a lot of noise, advertise these events, but also join part of the processions. And then they wouldn't have to be so dependent on uh, male brass bands that were often having to be brought down to London to take part in processions. And I, I love this image that she's really captured. And you can see how young a lot of these young girls look. Um, the lady on the left is Mary Lee, um, and uh, she was actually the first window smasher, Mary Lee, but she was also the drum major of the uh, uh, drum and fife band. This image was actually taken inside Prince's skating rink where the ex women's exhibition was held. And I love this little um, um, sign at the top that Christina has captured, which says this arrow towards the palmist. Um, you can imagine that being quite a popular um, uh, stall in, in, the, um, in the exhibition. There were actually 50 stalls in the exhibition. And at the beginning, um, this was actually a recruiting and a fundraising campaign. So as you entered the hall, you would be invited or encouraged to um, join up the WSPU, become a member and to buy a program, uh, buy votes for women newspaper. Um, and um, if you see the shot that she's taken down the hall, um, on the left hand and right hand side, you'll see these beautiful murals. And these were actually designed by, uh, by Sylvia Pankhurst, uh, specifically just for this two week event. You can imagine how exciting it must have been to enter to, for a lot of these women. And here is a wonderful shot that she took. She must have obviously been sort of on some sort of platform here, taking this image, looking down on the crowds who had come in to buy things from the 50 stalls, a lot of which were run by local, um, local, resident, uh, local branches. And in fact, uh, one of the branches that um, was uh, had a stall here was a special branch of the Women's Social and Political Union. And that stall was run by Leonora Tyson, another um, very esteemed local Streatham resident, um, who was the secretary of the um, uh, Streatham branch of the Women's Social and Political Union. And um, along with her mother and her sister, all three of them not only raised funds for the campaign, but also went to prison um, for suffragette militancy. Uh, this is probably one of my favourite images, I think, of the exhibition, and this depicts the refreshment stall. And the refreshment stall actually became the most lucrative financially of all the 50 stalls. It raised huge amounts of money. And one of the reasons it did so was because going out for cups of tea and having tea out had become very popular with women by the early 20th century. Um, if you can imagine, the women were um, becoming much more comfortable. It, there were a lot of more public spaces for women uh, by this time that they could actually go very respectable places like the Lions Tea Houses. Um, there was obviously places like Selfridges that had refreshment rooms. And so going out for a cup of tea was very, very popular with women. So it's not really surprising that uh, the refreshment stall here was the most lucrative and the busiest of the 50 stalls. I'm going to just read you out um, um, a quote from the Votes for Women newspaper, which I absolutely love, um, which said to women, a good idea is to make up parties for tea. One must have tea somewhere. Why not at Prince's? Invite your friends to meet you there for tea. So, you know, they were really playing on this idea of, oh, well, women must want to have a cup of tea. So therefore, why not come to the women's exhibition? And again, what um, Christina is capturing is the sort of broad range of women who were involved in the campaign. These were obviously all volunteers. They were obviously all suffragettes sympathizers. And you might just about see, if you look carefully, the tea service in the center. And again, a fantastic fundraising opportunity for the Women's Social and Political Union, because they specially commissioned this tea service, um, which has on it the trumpeting angel symbol designed by Sylvia Pankhurst. And after the exhibition, they 
they sold the tea services. And that's why you find quite a lot of those tea services turning up for auction still today. Um, obviously very, very expensive now, but we have an example of the teapot and the sugar bowl and um, the tea cup and uh, saucer in the museum. I wish we had the whole set, but certainly not. So here we are, here is another Christina Broom image uh, depicting the women actually having tea. You can see in the back um, a poster from Perrier and they actually sponsored, um, sponsored this, the refreshment stall along with, um, along with um, sorry, I just had to look at my watch and I thought, oh my God, I've got four minutes left, but then I realized we're here till 8.30. <laughs> sorry about that. And here's another stall. Uh, as you can see, these are quite posed images. I'm sure you might recognize um, to the second right, Emmeline Pankhurst, um, who of course featured very highly. And the fact that Christina took images of Emmeline and Christabel Pankhurst at the Women's Exhibition really shows to me that she was endorsed really as an official photographer at the event. She was not just capturing um, you know, random shots of the exhibition. She was actually getting people to pose for her photographs at the exhibition. Um, she was getting the Pankhurst to pose. So really that uh, represents to me that she was there in an official capacity and um, it was expected that um, her postcards would be widely sold, not just to profit her, but to profit the Women's Social and Political Union as well. This is the dress stall, and this was run by the Kensington branch of the WSPU. Um, and you can imagine what a spectacle it must have been. I mean, obviously, all of these images are in black and white, um, which I don't mind at all. I like black and white images, but I think by looking at her images, you can even imagine the sense of colours. Most of these dresses would have been in the purple, white and green colour scheme of the WSPU. So you can imagine how spectacular this event would have been. Here we have the hat stall and again, a very posed image um, of Emmeline Pankhurst in the centre here and Mabel Tuke uh, to her right another leader so these again were very sort of um christina you know sort of getting right to the heart of the leadership and um you know them sort of agreeing to to uh be part of her of her photographs uh the sweet stall this is very very glamorous i always think those beautiful outfits that the women were wearing and again here we have Emmeline Pankhurst um, to the slight right of the image. And the farm produce. And um, this lady, I think, in the front is, um, is um, actually, um, she's one of the judges of the farm produce stall. And prizes were given out um, to the women who had come down to London from all over the country to, um, to display and to sell their farm produce. Um, to support the campaign. There was also a very serious side to the um, exhibition that Christina captured. And this was a reconstruction of the cell that um, in Holloway prison that a lot of the suffragettes would have been incarcerated in. Um, and this was all about getting more public awareness really of, um, of the prison experience. Over a thousand women went to prison for suffragette militancy. And at this time in 1909, the women were forced to wear prison clothing and um, they were forced to undertake work. Um, you can see here, they, they look as if they're um, sort of demonstrating the type of work that they would have been done, which was things like sewing sacks. Um, and you were you had to pay six six old pennies to go into this uh, cell, and um, not only would you be able to experience the cell itself, but you would be able to talk um, to somebody who had actually been in prison and learn more about their experience. And I think we tend to think of places like Alcatraz and Robin Island as being very sort of modern in their approach to the way they have ex-prisoners taking people around. <laughs> well, suffragettes were doing this in 1909, obviously not in a real prison cell, but what they were doing was reconstructing a cell um, and putting an ex-prisoner in there. So, you know, way ahead of their time. 
And this, of course, was very much captured um, by Christina Broom. And if we didn't have these images, it would be actually very difficult for us to piece together uh, the, the sort of bountifulness of the women's exhibition. We could have read about it, but to actually have this sort of visual depictions of it um, really help us to understand um, what it was like to be, to be a visitor in this exhibition. In 1910, we see Christina going back into the streets um, and recording another series of um, processions undertaken by both the NUWSS and both the WSPU. And um, this was um, in response to a conciliation bill uh, that the government were putting before parliament, which may have given some women the right to vote. And um, as you can see, she captured this event of 1910 where women had come down to London from all over the country um, with their petitions to say, um, you know, to the government, look, we have this mass support for, the, for um, votes for women. Um, we've got these petitions. We're coming from Carlisle, we're coming from Kendall. We're coming from all over the country to prove to you that you should pass the conciliation bill. Something I absolutely love in the middle here is this little sandwich board man who has managed to photobomb this image of, of Christina's. And he's actually um, announcing an, a meeting against votes for women. I have no idea how he managed to get into the photo and why Christina didn't shove him out. But maybe she was really sort of, maybe this shows her sense of humor. I don't know. Maybe she, she sort of thought this was quite amusing that we have this little traditional sandwich board man announcing a, um, a vote, um, you know, a protest meeting against these women right in the middle of these women. And maybe it shows also their sense of humor as well. And I think that's something we tend to forget about the campaigns, you know, that we always think of them as being very serious women, but actually, you know, they many of them had a fantastic sense of humor and I think this image really captures that and probably Christina's sense as well. Uh, this um, 1910 um, was very highly choreographed as all um, suffrage processions were and here you have these are uh, the graduates procession so everyone was very ordered so if you were a graduate you were allowed to um, to walk with other fellow graduates in a specially designed space so you had to form up in a particular area and you would have very appropriate banners um, and as you can see, you were encouraged to attend in your graduation robes. And of course, this was to sort of prove to the nation that, um, you know, we are graduates. Uh, we, we should have the right to vote. We're, we're educated people, and yet we are denied the right to vote. Here is the um, artist's um, pageant. So if you were, uh, uh, many trained artists uh, were very attracted to the, um, to the uh, suffrage campaign. They were very skilled as well. So their skills were very important for designing banners, designing uh, propaganda, postcards and posters. And here, Christina has captured um, the artists holding, uh, can you see that they're all holding like a palette, an artist palette, beautiful image. And um, here she captures a, a different um, pageant, and this is the prisoners pageant. And this was the WA Women's Social and Political Union part of the procession. So these were the militants. Um, they, uh, uh, in, during the conciliation bill campaign, they often um, came together to, to um, march together, but then they also had their own separate um, um, spectacles and processions. And here we have the prisoner's pageant. And you were only allowed to walk in the prisoner's pageant if you had served a term of imprisonment for militancy. Um, and as you can see, they're carrying symbols of their imprisonment. Um, the, the gates that, which were used um, a lot, um, the sort of portcullis, which didn't just represent the Houses of Parliament, but to them was um, also a, a visible sort of reference to Holloway Prison. And women from the prisoners pageant always wore white. 
Um, here we have um, Emmeline Pethick Lawrence in the centre here, and she was one of the great leaders of the Women's Social and Political Union. And um, she actually devised the um, purple, white and green colour scheme. Uh, to her right is um, Sylvia Pankhurst. And then to the right of Sylvia is a lady that you may or may not recognise, and that's Emily Wilding Davison, who of course later on became perhaps very sadly notorious for throwing herself in front of the King's horse um, at the Epsom Derby of 1903, um, the injuries for which she unfortunately died. Um, they were part of the prisoner's pageant because they had served terms of imprisonment. And a wonderful, quite rare image actually of Emily Wilding Davison. So we have Christina Broom to thank for this uh, because there are not many images of EWD around. So um, it's great that she managed to capture her in this uh, prisoner's pageant. Uh, she also captured indoor meetings, um, not just of the WSPU, but also of a third of a second uh, militant organization called the Women's Freedom League. And this is one of uh, their meetings. Um, they held these uh, fundraising fairs called, um, called the Green, Gold and White, because that was their color scheme. And um, you can see, um, oh, green, white and gold. Sorry, I got it wrong. But the little boy has reminded me on his sash uh, that they're the green, white and gold fairs. And she captured these wonderful images in the courtyard of the exhibitions, um, the sort of family members of the, they're more like a portrait style, which was quite different from uh, her street views. Um, and here is a group at the WFL fair. And here we have Christabel Pankhurst and Charlotte Despard, two great leaders. Again, a portrait style, which was quite different. There were a lot of women who were, take, who were known to take portraits, uh, portrait photographers of suffragettes. Lena Connell is probably the most famous, um, but they were very much linked to the suffrage campaigns. They were often members of local branches. Lena Connell was linked to the Hampstead branch. Um, and um, we don't know anything about uh, Christina Broom, whether she was a supporter of the suffrage organization, of a suffrage organization, or whether she just saw, saw the suffrage campaigns as a, as a commercial opportunity. We know that when she left Streatham in 1904, she set up um, her business and her home in Fulham. And there might be a clue here to her relationship with um, um, the suffrage campaigners, uh, because here she took a picture in 1910 of the Putney and Fulham Women's Social and Political Union shop, um, which was at 905 Fulham Road. And um, you can see this amazing window of these shops. They had 19 branch shops in London. And again, they were very much an opportunity to raise funds. And it's quite interesting that Christina took this image because, as I say, it might give us a clue to the fact of her relationship on how she got involved with taking images of the campaign. Um, you can see that um, she's holding a loft, uh, this lady here is holding a loft a baby. Was she a contact of Christina Broom? We don't know. She was obviously somehow associated with the shop, but it's very strange that Christina has taken this photograph, which might suggest that maybe this is somebody she knew. It might have been her neighbour, and it might have been a neighbour like this, or an old neighbour back in Streatham, like Leonora Tyson who opened the door really to Christina to take images of the suffrage campaign and campaigners. I think, you know, a lot of people have spent a long time trying to get to the bottom of Christina Broom and, um, you know, her life as a, as a photographer, uh, whether she was affiliated to the, the suffrage movement, whether she was even a supporter of the suffrage campaign. But for me, as the curator of the museum's suffragette collection, that doesn't really bother me. I don't really care what her background was, what her feelings were. Um, but for me, what I do care about is how she has captured um, the suffrage campaigners and her unique way of capturing them. 
And I'm leaving, I'm finishing with this image here because I think of all the hundreds and hundreds of images that we have in our collection, this is by far my favorite. And it was taken by Christina in 1910. And as you can see, it depicts a lone suffragette standing very confidently holding a, a WSPU purple, white and green banner completely surrounded by boys and young men. You can imagine how this young woman, Charlotte Marsh, she was probably about 22 at the time. She used to refer to herself as Charlie, uh, Charlie Marsh, how confidently she was standing there. But it's not her confidence of the way she's standing there that is so amazing. It's really how Christina has captured that self-confidence, has captured this image of Charlotte, Charlotte standing so proud, so self-confident. And for me, that is the essence of what it was to be a suffragette. You needed courage, you needed bravery, but you also needed self-confidence. And that is what the campaign gave these women. And that is what Christina Broom captured. Of course, Christina wasn't just a photographer of, um, of suffrage. She, she was the uh, official photographer of uh, the Household Cavalry. Um, I think I've got that right, yes. And of course, some of the other more poignant images that she took uh, were just before the soldiers went to war in 1914. And some of you may have been um, have seen the book that um, accompanied an exhibition that the museum put on in 2016 um, about her, not just her suffrage images, but also her images that she took of soldiers. And like this image of Charlie Marsh, her images of soldiers are incredibly poignant. And they really sort of capture that amazing sort of spirit of those young men. They're very modern, very contemporary. If you look at someone like Charlie Marsh, she looks very modern. She's a familiar face. And that was how clever Christina was to, to sort of capture the modernity of, of these women at that time and left, latterly the soldiers. And um, that's how we can relate to them so much and how they bring out so much emotion um, with, amongst those of us who have the privilege um, to, uh, to see her images today.